<clears throat> okay, okay. Uh, thank you, everybody, for attending this session. So I have a very interesting title today, OpenStack HR or not HA? That's a question. And the reason why I decided to talk about this is because uh, at Word Day we have a very interesting use case about um, how complex is actually OpenStack, and in top of that, in the top of that, we have to run up uh, HA for multiple components. So I want to describe a little bit as a user story what is our our experience, and maybe maybe having the the audience to un uh, ask me some questions of why we we took this, um, these decisions. So let's start with myself, my introduction. My name is Edgar McGanna. I'm um, Cloud Operations Architect at Worday. I'm also a member of the User Committee in um, the OpenStack Foundation. Um, I was former um, core for the Neutron team. So yes, part of my blame, uh, Neutron. I'm also involved in Open Control, the user group. I'm part of the advisory team. And, um, doing a lot of open source, um, have a wonderful team at, at Word Day, so it's been a very, very busy year for us, so we're very glad to be here. As you know, we were finalists, we didn't win, but just being there, it was uh, an amazing experience, so this is what we did to get there. So let's start with very simple things. You, um, I'm gonna walk you through what we did to understand OpenStack from scratch all the way to our production systems. So I'm not gonna waste your time on the agenda just to give you an idea that it's gonna be uh, long and painful, painful to be here. So everybody in this room, because I put this advanced, it's boring to see this diagram. You all know these components. Actually, this is just probably now uh, half of the typical components that the production cloud run. As you remember in the user uh, survey, we have in average nine to 10 projects that uh, most of the production cloud deploy. Uh, so this is, this is just the minimal. This is kind of like the core projects. And I like to start with here because this is very easy, right? You look at this, you say, not a big deal. And then I say my team, okay, let's, let's go a little bit deeper. Let's understand what is these uh, boxes. So you have seen this picture as well. Nothing fancy. Yeah, it started becoming a little bit scary, but yeah, you know, like, you know, all these components, they have their database schema. You can put all these schemas in the same database, so it's not a big deal. You actually have REST APIs for each one of these components. Still not a big deal because, you know, you can have the same process in the top of all of them. You can unify all these. And you say like, okay, let's start reading the the documentation. Let's start getting more familiar. This is good from the research part. This is good from the POC to understand what is going on on my servers before running OpenStack. So now let's start thinking what the community is going to be deploying in common. You don't want to be the weird guide in the neighborhood, right? You want to follow others. This is why we are a community. We exchange our uses. Uh, stories or use cases, etc. So you don't want to feel yourself alone in this in this uh, world called OpenStack. So we went to the basic documentation and we found this picture, very nice one, and said like, "Wow, it looks good." So basically, you need a bunch of projects who has Git, GitHub repositories. You have packages from different um, distros, companies, Red Hat, SUSE, etc. And then you have um, basically options for the backend storage, MySQL, MariaDB. You also need a message boost to let all these multiple components to communicate each other, as we show in the previous picture, right? So the message boost is all around. So not a big deal. We have RabbitMQ, we have KPU. So we have all these things. Then you have to have a bunch of compute nodes. You should be able to add as many as you want, right? As many as the the system uh, supports until it breaks because you don't know when it's going to break until it breaks. Um, so it's not that huge deal. So what happened at Word Day? Let's do it, right? Let's build all this thing. Shouldn't be that painful. So we start talking to our internal customers. By the way, Word Day is an internal private cloud. So our customers are internal people, our own, you know, coworkers. And, and also we realized that um, one simple closer will not be enough. 
So we need to create a recipe for um, the typical uh, uh, cookie cutter to actually deploy multiple clusters. So number one, automation, and that's one of the most important things. Um, idempotent, because we don't want clusters to be different between each other, especially you know, in the configuration we want to be like very, very homogeneous. However, there are certain configuration parameters but that we do want to be different. I'm going to give you an example. Um, CPU over, over allocation. You're always going to have your dev environments before going to your production environments. In our case, we designed the system that the over allocation is something configurable from the high level perspective and not the same in all the clusters. Basically, what I'm telling you is in our dev environments, our, our over allocation, it's something that we can change one to two, one to four. We can go a little bit crazy because it's still a little bit of more of comfort area. However, in our production system, we would like to be a little bit more conservative, especially on the, fir the first run out of the, of the cloud, right? We don't want to go like too wild, so we want to make it one one. So even that we have the same uh, process to deploy multiple clusters in all our data centers, we have certain parameters that we abstracted out of the uh, common configuration to make it unique to our system. Now, scalable, right? You don't want to run three servers. Um, our data centers allocate hundreds of servers, so we want to make it uh, possible to run as many compute, uh, compute nodes as we want to add without breaking the system. The most important, the ones that actually draw me crazy across uh, all, this, all this time, um, security. SSL everywhere. APIs, obviously. I will agree 100% with that one. Uh, for the people who drives uh, public, um, public clouds, uh, having SSL in the public APIs and the, I'm sorry, in the public uh, URLs, in the private URLs or internal URLs, maybe makes sense. For us, I was fighting too much with security, and guess what? I lost. So we enabled SSL everybody, everywhere, sorry. Um, even in RabbitMQ, um, I will say, I will have to admit, they gave us a lot of help. Um, something that I will encourage you and your teams, if you have a security team and security is a, a big concern, uh, engage them from the very beginning in the project. Uh, they're going to help you. It's a lot of fun building this. So um, in our case, we have our security team investing a lot of time resources on this, um, on this project. Um, IP tables at the, at the host level. We're running IP tables at the host level, and we have a little bit of an issues in that part that I'm going to share with you in a little bit. Um, obviously, it needs to be stable, right? And stable means two things, control plane and data plane. I don't want to go to the end of the presentation, but we're going to focus on these two planes in a little bit. Uh, production readiness. So I'm talking to my operations team. We say, we're going to give you this baby to you, and you're going to run it. And I would say, like, hey, hold your horses. I need to see what's going on. I need to see from the dashboard, from fancy graphs. I need to have alerts. I need to see the login. I need to see all these cool stuff that I need for a production system to be sure that it's going to be running 24-7, 365. OK, got it. We're going to do it. Um, our configuration in the data center, it's very unique. We cannot change it. Um, and I like to put these in the slides all the time, bonded physical interfaces per server, because when you start running um, uh, things like uh, uh, some of the uh, fuel or other distros, and I don't have anything in favor in or versus any of those ones, they assume that you have the um, ability to change your data center infrastructure the way they want it. And that's not right. Actually, our data center has a specific configuration for HA that we couldn't change. So all the servers, they have to the next interfaces bonded, go to the uplinks for HA. So if we lose one of the next, the other one will still want the traffic. So we want to have HA different places. Um, Multi-tenant, obviously, and the last one, and the critical point of this, um, it's high availability. So everything before sounds like um, you know, interesting, we spike all these areas. Um, high availability was um, something very interesting. So again, we went back to the books and I said like, let me review again the architecture. Let me see all the components. Okay, I need all these boxes. If I want to provide HA, I need to repeat all these um, in a typical three cluster, five cluster, etc. Okay, it's becoming a little bit of uh, complication. So let me go back to the typical, you know, um, uh, providers that they know all about these and trying to get it. So I found this picture 
which is really good from TCP Cloud. This, uh, their reference architecture in HA is public. I actually have the link at the bottom of the slide. Um, I'm not going to spend a lot of time in this slide, but I want to highlight something. That is not easy to deploy. It is not. So I say, okay, um, good. I mean, it's a wonderful architecture. I love it. As an architect, I love it. I want to drive my team, which is actually sometimes struggling, is still learning in OpenStack to that monster. Let me find something else. So I went to Mirantis, um, just as a reference. Again, I don't have any favor for any, any of them. And I found a little bit, um, a little bit more simple. But actually what I realized that it's just simpler in, in paper, not really in implementation. So I actually have this face after that, right? What the edge? How can I convince these guys who's gonna learn OpenStack to actually deploy those things, right? So I went back and say, okay, let's plan it a little bit better. Hold your horses and let's go a little bit more simplistic. So I say, forget about the HA. And actually could use another word, but this is a very polite meeting. So, um, so this is actually the word they architecture nowadays. Um, you will see, you don't see HA, do you? No, it doesn't. I'm not saying that we don't have HA. And that's the tricky part of the conversation that we're having today. Um, that, is at the, that is at the WPC level. And the bottom line here is there are certain ways that you can provide still HA to your production clusters when you don't want to go to the monster that I showed before. We're going there. I'm not saying we're not going there, but let's do baby steps, right? Let's go step by step. So this is a very simple architecture. Let me drive you through that one. Is this working? Yeah, sure. So the first box is actually the OpenStack controller, the typical one. As I uh, told you before, we have one interfaces, so just one uplink from the logical point of view. Uh, top of the rack switches, it uh, doesn't really matter what uh, kind of switch because uh, with SDN technologies, they've just become like a thick wire for the, for the hypervisors. Um, on the first box, we have the typical things. Um, uh, we have Apache as a front end because Keystone at the version that we're running is uh, still using the Evelyn libraries, which was a namer in performance, so we uh, get rid of it and we have Apache on the top of it um, for, for Keystone and we start moving it for other services like Glens. Then we have all the other services, Nova, Horizon, Cinder, Glens. As you can see, I don't have um, Silometer, I don't have Heat, I don't have all that good stuff because we were not ready for them. Why should I start implementing all those crazy projects if we, if we don't ready for it? By the way, I forget to mention that when you're planning all these, what do you do first? Go to the documentation and find the monsters diagrams and get scary and have that, what the edge phase that I have at that time, or you decided to do it like little to little, piece by piece, and have an architecture as flexible as possible to add and remove components as you start growing your uh, cloud, and on the top of that, just your cases, right? Ask yourselves what is gonna be the path that are gonna be running. I just want VMs, I just want these kind of things, so maybe, maybe this architecture is good for the next year or two of your production clusters, I don't know. <clears throat> the, the next box is actually the part of SDN. It's actually, uh, we're using Open Control. We're using the second, the 2.21 version. This is, uh, as you can see, it uses two boxes. The first box is when we have all the configuration and control uh, components, and the next one is about analytics. Uh, this is actually becoming a best practice deployment because the uh, data that actually the analytics are getting from all the big routers, which is in, the, in your hypervisors, will be massively injected into this Cassandra database. So why do you want to avoid is that the data for configuration and, and control gets stuck because this Cassandra is too busy uh, reading and, and writing data from the analytics that if you don't really have a use case for analytics, guess what, you will never use them. Um, so this is, this is best practice. What I like about this model is if you ended up losing the control analytics, nothing happens. Yeah, some things in the UI would not work. Who cares? Who uses the UI to actually uh, make changes on the, on the configuration? Well, I do it sometimes just for demos, but uh, just to be fancy. 
Uh, but everything is automated, everything is through the APIs, um, so that's the way we do it. All the configuration changes are not injected neither from the, uh, from the web UI or something directly. It's everything, every, not even REST API calls directly to either the open stack controller or the control controller. It's everything software that we develop um, Python code that calls the, the APIs in a very, very nice and automated way. Um, on the bottom, um, one of the uh, key changes that we did is actually, um, so we noticed if we were losing this, this big box, we were able to reproduce that box because we are using Chef, and if JJ is around, he will be very happy because I say the word Chef. Um, so we're using Chef for configuration management. Uh, so it's very easy for us to reproduce these boxes at any time. What is very hard is to recover all your data instantaneously, right? So we did a very, a very simple trick to this architecture to actually have an repli active replication to another box when you just have MySQL, so all the data is here. And you will say like, yes, but it's not active-active, so you will need to manual configuration, so yes, we don't care. And you will see why we don't care in a little bit. And then you start adding a lot of compute nodes. Um, there is interesting projects to provide in HA at the compute node. It's still, from my personal point of view, and you can point of view, and you can disagree with me. That's that's the beauty of this um, this kind of conference. There are projects to uh, will let you to use another user here that is going to talk to a zookeeper that is going to report that is going to blah 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 and it's going to relaunch another um, uh, user agent here to re, uh, restart or, or, or auto heal this um, user speak agent. Uh, it's cool, but it's a little bit overkill, right? Baby steps, maybe the day or tomorrow. I'm not saying it's not, but don't go crazy. It's my advice. We are here to share stories. My story is like, don't go crazy. Start, start with these um, simple steps. So that's, that's where we are. And then I, I decided to went back to the, to the slide that I had before. And, and I know everybody wants to go to the party. I want to go to the party. Um, so I, I'm not going to spend a lot of time so, but actually we were able to fulfill all these requirements. On the automation, we started using Jenkins and Chef. We have a very strong uh, CI, CD system. It's one of the key uh, successful factors for Worddate to have a production system. We are repeatable creating um, these clouds. We call it over cloud because you're using, we are using, and I want to clarify, the concept of OpenStack on OpenStack. So once we have our first version of OpenStack, we build a small clusters, and that is small cluster, which is our dev environment. We start using it and giving tenants to all, uh, all our internal developers to build over clouds. And with simple scripts, they can actually create a full the same architecture that I, that I showed before, and then actually cool changes. Um, I don't know, for instance, uh, one of the key changes that we're going to do in the previous architecture is to move the MySQL database on the controller out of that box. So we can easily uh, try all these changes, test it. Um, it's a disposable, repeatable environment, which is very, very helpful. If somebody's interested in that CI, CD, you just Google it, OpenStack, Lat Summit, CI, CD, Word, and you will see the whole presentation that we did about that. So um, reviewing all these, um, again, for a dependency, Chef, Scalable, we're able to have right now um, 8,000 cores per cluster. Uh, we have all these secure things. Uh, uh, that's something that actually helped us to uh, be as a super user analyst because we did a lot of contribution upstream on Chef for SSL support. It was weak in that part, so we did all that contributions in our team. We actually test a couple, uh, fix a couple of boxes in, in um, Keystone for uh, scalability that we also found. Um, we integrated a bunch of things for, for monitoring, so we have a um, total of probably over 200 different Nagios checks, so maybe yeah, around, around the number, uh, from the basic CPU, MEM, all that, to actually every single process that we run to see the health. And we have alarms threshold that we trigger uh, for each one of them. So something happens, we have the knock team, they have these huge screens with the negative checks, something goes red, there's a ticket that is open, and it's all the process that is going on, right? So you're all familiar with that. Um, the last part, well, Bonnet that we didn't do anything, we just make sure that it was work with that, um, especially the SDM part, multi-tenant, and then high availability, right? Is that fulfilled? For some people will say no, I would say no, it's not, but there is, 
there's a few things that I would like to share today about how we actually indeed fulfill HA. So I'm gonna move to a little bit about concepts because before jumping to, to the next slide, I would like to review basic concept of HA. So probably everybody's familiar with all these concepts. Stateless versus stateful, right? So we do have both in OpenStack and I just put like all the Nova processes, most of the process API is stateless versus persistent and the message boost that actually are um, uh, stateful. Another concept that I want to quickly review is active-active versus active-passive. Um, Basically, in active-passive, you maintain a backup. So as you can see in our architecture, we have um, active backup, um, sorry, um, active-passive for our MySQL and nothing for the active-active in, in the other process at this level. Um, but that's the main difference, right? Active, active, you have another system that replicated automatically and it will be promoted or it will be some kind of low balance distributing the calls, you know, then one of them uh, it's down, all the calls will be to the another one. And that's kind of like the key of active active, that you don't promote, you don't touch the system, you build a higher level architecture on the top of your app API to actually distribute the calls to more than one API line. So everybody what is doing there is just creating, instead of one box, three boxes, HA proxy in the top, of, uh, keep a light, and then it's gonna distribute to these boxes. Can you do that at different level? Yes, you can. Hold that thought. Then we're gonna talk about control plane and data plane. You need to provide a chair at both levels, right? Control plane is just the ability to change the configuration of your cloud, creating your tenants, changing your quotas, obviously creating VMs or whatever virtualization technology you ended up doing, um, changing uh, your network configuration, adding security uh, groups, blah, 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 everything, right? All that is the control plane. Data plane is actually the communication from your users or end uh, clients all the way to the VMs and vice versa. That is the data plane. You want both. In my case, I prefer to have a gap in my control plane than in my data plane. I don't want my customer running an application in production and suddenly, hey, what happened? Timeouts is gone, right? It's a private cloud. So I have certain ability to control the number of VMs and the concurrency of the VMs that I deploy. But in the data plane, I have zero control. My user could start sending, downloading traffic, and I have visibility, but I will not tell you, hey, um, do you rather not download that file because I think it's gonna be a little bit big. You can't do that, right? It's a joke. Um, finally, quorums versus clusters. I'm sorry, quorums and clusters. I mean, talking the whole day, sorry. Um, the quorums is uh, this ability to have a, um, a certain number of entities um, uh, to make a decision. You don't want just one person to make a decision. You want to have current to make a decision and cluster is just ability to replicate the same architecture at the same level uh, multiple times. So um, high availability, let's go back to that, right? Two key factors, control plane and data plane. Control plane, why we need to actually satisfy high availability in control plane. We create the concept of worthy availability zones. Forget about OpenStack availability zone, it's worthy availability zone. It's our network infrastructure at the core level that we develop to have HA for all the services that will be running in our infrastructure from the top of the rack to the bottom or for the architects in tech networking from the upper rack to the top because they draw things upside down. I don't know why, but anyway. Um, so a quickly description. Um, the, the availability zone is a full redundant network um, all the way from the edge routers, firewalls, low balancers, core network, etc. top of the rack. This is why we had the bonded interfaces and this is why we couldn't change it. And this is why when somebody came to you and said like, oh yeah, but you want to have um, this technology, you have to have three interfaces. One is gonna be your data traffic, your management traffic, your API traffic, and your out of band traffic. How many racks you need, how many top of the racks you need to actually satisfy all those physical ports? Um, so no, we just have one. Um, and the out of band, that is out of this scope. We do have out of band to our servers, obviously, to have, uh, to do things like, you know, bios changes, auto provisioning, color, and all that uh, good stuff uh, from the infra team. Um, 
these are very specific details about the our architecture. So um, instead of giving you all the full speech of things that you can actually see recorded later or, or from our slides, I would like to show you what it looks like in our data center. So this is the AC architectural design. That looks a little bit complex, but it's not that really complex. And I intentionally, it looks a little bit weird because I have to intentionally block a few parts that are actually confidential information that I could not share with you, unfortunately. But the most important parts are here, right? Uh, from the edge router, everything is in purse, as you can see. And that's the important part. So we have the edge firewall, the edge router, the, yeah, or the edge firewall, the edge router, the core networking. These are the, um, MX, uh, the MX routers for the SDN gateway. Um, Obviously, all our uh, top of the rack switches are going in peers like uh, little friends all the time. And this is what WPC is running. So how can I leverage this architecture to the point that I can satisfy my HA without changing my current open stack architecture? Well, it's very, very simple. You build two of these. And you build one cluster in each one of them. So what happened? is you simply replicate your architecture that you have at this, uh, at this level in two sides, and you have the ability to control your API calls to your user all the way to one cluster or the another cluster. So this is killing, um, this is killing um, a fly with a bullet, but on the other hand, with the size of our data centers, this is actually one of the best decisions that we can um, have taken. It's a big investment. No doubt about it. But this is just one of the components that we run in, a data, in our data center. We have a bunch of more staff that we have the same level of, our, of, um, of HA or persistent, et cetera. So we wanted to build a very formal, a very robust uh, network architecture, and this is what we call it, availability zones for our services. And we, WPC, just leverage that. So this is a user story. This is our path to production, and this is why. So now we have one cluster per data, per data center per availability zone. But because that amazing team at work did a, a wonderful job and, and actually had the ability to, through Chef, simple changes in data bags, create multiple clusters, so you can quickly change these to even adding more clusters to one availability zone. So even in the worst case scenario, to you lose a completely an availability zone, you can create another cluster very, very quickly and redirect through um, uh, low balancer changes to the uh, public API or the Keystone to a different cost cluster. Really, really simple. So that's contemplating, and that's um, even even that I believe that's one of the most complicated things. It wasn't. It wasn't the that. So we have uh, we have a very good partnership with our networking and infrastructure team, and that's we reach um, that point. So that was that was actually great. So moving on to have question for um, time for questions. So um, now let's talk about the data plane. So the data plane it's fully controlled or mostly controlled by the SDM parts. So as I said before, we're using control, open control. This is the typical open control architecture, so you can download it here from all the documentation. There is nothing magic here. There is nothing that I, I could, um, um, if you want to learn more about the open control, uh, tomorrow from 6 to 9, the open control user group is going to get together, especially the advisory, the advisory group, to understand um, what are the, um, the, um, the gaps for the, for, the, for the project that actually we can fulfill. So in terms of the architecture, what I can, what I can highlight is the part of the bit router, right? The bit router is actually the, the path that actually keeps sending the traffic to between the, the other VMs in the same, in the, same uh, the cluster are, they can even do it across different clusters as long as you have connectivity to your MX gateways. Um, in our case, big, big, big point I forgot to mention, we have what we call a full rotable layer tree network. So we don't use, this is going to be hard to explain, we don't use private networks, but everything is a private network. So we have um, um, an, a very large slash H network that use, we use as SDN network. So everything is rotable, everything is reachable. 
you will see very fancy OpenStack demos, especially for the SDN vendors, creating a, a public network and a private network and a router and a low balancer and a lot of connection there in there. And it's very cool, and you can do it with this. But guess what? Our use cases doesn't really require all that things. Everything is uh, uh, a provided network, which is the concept that is more uh, common known in the, in the, especially in the networking community here in, in OpenStack. So everything is a provider network, which means it's, it's routable. And the way we protect the communication between them is through a very high and severe set of security groups or rules. We ended up having, and this is a key, inform a key uh, point, around some cases even 80 um, different security groups per uh, port, per subnet or virtual network in our, in our system. Why? Because by default, what we do in, um, with Open Control is every time that we create a virtual network, it's, uh, we close all the doors. Everything is denial. And then you start opening the doors that your security team has approved. Uh, we don't do it touching the system. We do it through the most wonderful thing that I found in engineering, which is source code. So we have a project that we actually uh, uh, called uh, WPC Environments. That's just a name. But basically, it's a set of the policy rules. And the policies are not written in uh, control-specific Python code. No, that would be a terrible mistake. Everything is in YAML files, which means that everybody could actually, from the networking point, not everybody, networking people can understand how to write a new security policies without knowing nothing about this architecture. And that demo file could be sent to another team in infra or networking and be translated into either IP tables or uh, configuration for the other part of our availability zones at the networking. They don't need to know. Nothing is attached to control at that point. Focusing in the, in the, in the data plane, um, so the most important thing is uh, the beer router actually communicates, um, has the ability to have to uh, run in something that is called headless mode. So in the, in, in the worst case scenario that we lose all the controller, the beer router will maintain, and that's something that you can configure from the, from the installation. It's being configurable to not lose the BIFS uh, configuration, basically all the routing configuration for, uh, for the current state of the network. Yes, you lose your control plane to that point, but you don't have your customers creating tickets because they lost data in their VMs or they cannot connect to their VMs or they were SSH into their VMs, the combination hung up and you don't have an idea what happened. It's better to have a trying to create a VM, there is an error, uh, network not available, something like that, that you have information to react to having a customer like, hey, what happened? I was SSH, hang out, I cannot connect, I don't know what's going, I'm going crazy, try the annoyed SSH, and things are really, really bad. Um, you lose certain things, and um, for the people who is very familiar with control, and uh, wanna catch me in a very interesting point, you will say, well, but control has certain specific management things in the control plane that you may lose. The key one is DNS. And I will tell you, yes, you're right, and you're very smart, but this is what I'm discovering myself in advance. One of the things that we're doing to solve that problem is instead of configuring the DNS or the virtual DNS and the only entry on the VMs to have connectivity uh, uh, from inside to the external world, we have a second entry of the DNS of configuration on the clients to talk to our physical DNS that actually are highly redundant in our data center. So that should provide the, the, the right results that we are expecting. So we shouldn't be losing any kind of uh, uh, data plane at all. So this is not a session about open control, but we can, we can have an extended uh, uh, session on open control if you want it. Um, so yes, actually we're happy. Like, no, we are not extremely happy. But we're good, right? But yes, we want to build a more complex architecture per one of our clusters. But now we know exactly what we need to put. I don't need to drag somebody else's diagram, somebody else's HA um, model. I'm building, or we are building our own model. So we just start extending the things that we know. 
So we know that we need an HA proxy. We, need, uh, we know that we need HA uh, keep alive. Maybe we can actually virtualize all this part. Maybe I can actually use this as a platform, as a service, because there is nothing, really nothing in OpenStack that, that is needed in these two boxes that you cannot run from another service that is already providing HA. You can actually move the whole thing to F5, low balancer, just to mention one vendor, oops. Um, or, or something else that you have already in the data center. Use what you have. You do not remind the will. Um, on the controllers, we have the ability to run this, this, and this. So it's, it's very, very straightforward. You just need to change your uh, code books, in our case, for Chef, to actually have the Rabbit and Queue in, um, in HAQs. And the Galera, uh, somebody say, hey, uh, you, you draw is wrong because you need three for code. Um, yeah, you're right. So it's just another box. It's not a big deal. Um, the configuration of the Cassandra is exactly the same. So you can start extending your HA architecture. And you may end it off with the same scary picture that I show in the beginning. But now it's your scary picture. You know what is behind it. You control it. You can make changes. And that's what I really want to bring you. So uh, key takes away. Um, this is my personal advice because I really like what we have done at work, they do it by yourself. I know you love the distros. I know you love all these uh, companies around there, but try it by yourself. It may, it may, look, uh, it may uh, look painful and long, et cetera, but it's because most of the, the operators and users are trying to deploy very complex HA architecture. So don't go crazy, baby steps, and you will do it. Uh, focus on your, your cases. Don't try to resolve everything. Maybe layer three is good enough. Maybe you don't need provided networks. Maybe you don't need loss balancer as a service, firewall as a service, yeah, service chaining, and God knows what is going to come for the next release. So focus on your use cases and satisfy the use cases. If the use cases able to change, make an architecture to be flexible enough to be adopting or evolving as your use cases are evolving. Um, obviously, be, uh, be, be brave and lose, uh, use the latest releases. Um, it's going to take some time, and you realize that there are releases every six months, and then you say, oh, I'm using this stable version, so I don't know if I should be tech or not. I'm I, I going to start with Liberty, and you start with Liberty, and then you start running POCs, and then we're going to have Newton out of the door, and, and Okara will be planning, and then you end it up with a version that in a year, a year and a half, people will say, like, are you still running Liberty? That's just crazy. Um, Build your own. Um, I'm sorry, there are many ways to provide HA. That was the goal of the session, just to give you an alternative to provide HA to your control plane and your data plane. Um, build your own CI, CD. That's critical. This is basic. As I said before, we have a very long presentation on this part. If you're interested in how we build it at work day. Um, try to not get a stuck in your architecture. So make an architecture that can be flexible. One of the most interesting conversations that I have with the smart team that I have is that they are breaking apart my architecture. So I feel like, ah, why do you need an architect? So you're changing things. But that's, that's healthy, and that's the way it has to be done. So be flexible, understand that the architecture needs to evolve as, you, as the project evolves. Um, be ready for change, and obviously have fun. So thank you so much. I'm ready for any kind of questions that you have. And Please use any of the micros. So I don't see nothing because of these lights. So, um, so there's, when, when we go back to your slide about what you have with your HA, um, it's actually still not HA because you don't have any fencing. So I don't have what? Fencing. So if something goes wrong on a node, the node stays alive. And while with HA, the node, you're actually killing that node so that you're sure that it's not disrupting anything. So a good example, if you keep alive, he's, going, he's not walking, and you have uh, HA proxy not working on a node, but the, VIP, the virtual IP is still running, then you know, things go wrong. You need fencing to fix that. So it's still, I mean, for me, it's not HA. It's on the right way, I would say, but it's not HA. So it's, I would say that your requirement about HA is not met. That's, so that was not a question. That was an observation. No, that, that, that's a first comment. So I can actually and reply to your observation in the following way. If this is not HA for you, obviously the other architecture is not HA. So I disagree with you. 
I, I disagree with you because the goal of this conversation is to have uh, HA different levels, right? And I could agree with you in the technical part, and this is not about making an okay. argument who's right or who's not. You're right. You're certainly right. My point here is to start making baby steps. So you are jumping the trigger to a more complex architecture that we may end up in six months, be there, but I don't want to start driving crazy the group of engineers that I have with an architecture that it's not going to be comprehensive. But uh, I agree with you. I mean, I just want to correct the, the fact that this is not HA. I mean, people might think it is HA. It's not yet HA. The, the second point I, I had was like when you made the, the big diagram about how it looks like with the HA architecture and it's difficult to deploy and so on. That is true, um, but that's, it's true if you do it by yourself. If you use a tool that does it for you, then it's not difficult. Sure. Like, so it's, okay. it's, I think it's a matter of whether you have the requirement to do it by yourself, which was actually not listed, but I think you had it. Sure. Thanks. So, Another uh, good observation. Uh, but if you don't need to do it by yourself, then you can actually, it's not difficult. Sure. Hi, I had a question about your uh, Neutron implementation. Did you, uh, what HA solution did you choose for Neutron? I know you have Contrail, I don't know if that's, I'm not familiar with it, so. Sure, so Contrail replaces 100% Neutron. So the only thing that we deploy with Neutron is the Neutron server for the API. We don't even use the Neutron schema. Contrail replaces the whole thing. So um, all the control plane is managed by the components that I show in the control architecture and the data plane is also controlled by the bit routers. We lack of the same problem. If you lose the bit router, you actually lose connectivity to that VM. But it's exactly the same problem that you have with, with Neutron with the, either the OBS or the Linux bridge agent gets down. So is it, is it basically bridge to the Contrail re replacements? So like, do you set up your bonds and then you build your bridges and then just let it be a drop in replacement that spawn it, or a bridge to that interface or? It's, it's very similar, but it's not exactly that way. Um, okay. So the, the, the Neutron server, basically, you use the open control plugin, and basically it's just a proxy call of the API call. Uh, so it ended up in control, and there's a long process happening. On the, on the, on the compute machine, uh, so there is the BHOS interface that is automatically created by the agent space of the, of the control, and it's actually where the control bit router will be change, making all the changes. Um, so Nova will make uh, the Nova, the user space in Nova will create the, obviously the VM and it will create the TAP interfaces and the VM router will make the connection between the TAP interfaces and the BIF interfaces inside of this um, control bit router. That's the way it works in a very high level. So there is no components at all of Neutron but the Neutron server, uh, the API. So the last question I had is about um, how you do monitoring and logging. Um, do you use Solometer or do you use anything like that to push or do you like aggregate all your logs and look at them in one central place because I know you saw you had the um, the block for Contrail logging right or analytics or whatever yes that's that's a good question so the login um, we have um, we send all the all the logins to our syslog we actually have an internal project uh, we call it Solas just internal to actually collect all the logins and send it to the to um, something similar to the Elk server for actually aggregate all the logs of all these components. On the monitoring part, there is a Nagios checks running in each one of the servers. Uh, obviously for the controller boxes, there are multiple um, Nagios checks. Uh, for the compute nodes, it's much more or less uh, the Nagios checks. All they're reported to the Nagios server. And at Worthy, we have, um, we work with a company, I don't know it's a startup anymore, but it's, it's called Wayfrom. And actually they produce a very cool dashboard. Uh, so we have a kind of like a plugin that we connect with the Nagios uh, server. So we abstract out of the Nagios all the information. Uh, we have a fancy uh, dashboard that actually show you everything you want. Um, so for instance, we have lately a requirement to see, now I, I can see the CPU average, I can see the memory, but I have, uh, I have a PM, which is actually in the room, asking me like, but I don't, I don't know nothing about the capacity. I don't know how many VMs are you running. I don't know how many uh, cores are you using, how many are left, how can I allocate more if needed. So we also use that mechanism to collect information out of the cluster. So sometimes we don't just collect the NAT information out of the hypervisor. We actually call them from, from the Nagios check API calls to the system for uh, capacity or even for performance. So how much, 
how long it's going to take an API call directly to the system. Thank you. Thank you. So you're deploying multiple independent OpenStack installation into different data centers, and then just spreading the workload amongst them. Do you use anything to um, centrally target these installations, or are you just in individually talking to ah, that's the a different good question. Ones? That's perfect, yes, it's what we do. So um, as I said before, this is all chef driving, and we don't have a chef server well, let me correct. Yes, we do have a chip server for this availability data centers, let's put it that way, because things are changing. But um, it's just for scalability. All the artifacts from the chip server are coming from the same point. And we are so brave at Worthy, we actually do patches every Friday night. So what, but practically a patch means it's an update on the artifacts on the chip server that are already very well tested, and they get the spread ac across all the data centers. So all these cluster chip clients are running every 15 minutes. So at the moment that you actually push on new artifacts on the chip server, the chip client will contact in the, in, the, in the moment that they need to contact, and they will pull all the new changes. If you have an, uh, an upgrade, for instance, we run a very good uh, experience running Chef uh, upgrades, which uh, you update, you change the packages in your, or you add the new packages in your jam repos, and then you change your kubo say like, you're not gonna use uh, the um, uh, Inferno uh, version of Chef, uh, you're gonna use the Hammer version, so automatically happened, and it was, it was really cool. We haven't tried it for, for OpenStack, because indeed, if somebody asked me about upgrades, um, I'm not planning to do upgrades, I'm planning to kill one of these clusters that I showed before, and, um, I don't know, what is it? Um, chuk, chuk, chuk. Killing one of the clusters and actually um, build the other one with a new version of Open Control, Open Stack, and then um, having all the load in, the, in these ones. Uh, once I'm, I'm very happy with a new one, I will actually uh, kill all the stateless VMs from this one, having it in these ones, uh, using the Ceph uh, uh, for the persistence ones. And then once I have all, all the VMs evacuated from this cluster, I will kill it again and reinstall it with the new version of OpenStack, leveraging the same point. Another thing to keep, um, maybe, maybe you want to know why, how we actually keep these clusters equally, not just from the configuration management point of view, but from the um, onboarding process. So we also use uh, Python code as the same way that we create the policies through Python code. All the tenants creation, quotas configuration, flavors, uh, networks, etc. Everything is is done by Jerry. So basically, the 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 workflow is like somebody file a ticket uh, to to service now. We should have a piece of code in Jerry. This approved by security. It gets deployed to the clusters everywhere. Uh, maybe one more question because it's but. Two questions. <laughs> so the first one is uh, related to this uh, HA architecture. So this one, if you're enforcing the users to put their application in two different uh, uh, clouds, then it will have sacrifices on either on the performance issues related to networking, which, which it has to travel from one cloud to another. And the second one is also has to related to orchestration. So you cannot have a single stack that is deployed across multiple clouds. So the first part is um, if we were letting the customers or our users to deploy the VMs that belongs to the same um, multi-tier application, you will be right, but we don't let to do that. We have something in the middle between the customer, the users, and OpenStack APIs to avoid that part. So it's an internal ploy, we call it Gourmet, but it's basically something like Cloud Foundry. It's a very easy way that actually is application aware, platform as a service, to let you distribute the VMs in the, in the, in the way that they will be kind of like VM affinity, right, in the same host, in the same cluster, to actually avoid that part. Uh, for the second question, could you repeat it a little bit, because I was a little bit... Uh... Okay, the second question would be related to the MX gateway. So does your architecture work uh, without this MX gateway portion? Because that one is a very expensive uh, hardware piece. So does it work without this one? Good, good, good point. Um, theoretically, it does. Because Open Country provides uh, a soft, uh, software gateway as any other company. Uh, with the amount of traffic that you will be sending, I don't think you will, you will be happy with the performance yeah. using all the traffic to a software gateway. Uh, for this kind of uh, architecture, it will, it will not make sense to do a software. It's expensive, but it's, it's actually that we need to keep the performance of the data center. Okay, thank you.
Thank you. Thank you, everybody, for attending. Have a good summit.